Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your goodness, your mercy, and kindness, for the blood of your Son that cleanses from all sin. We thank you, Lord God, for the privilege of coming before you, being called by your name, knowing that you've placed us here at this time in history, not only appointed to your wonderful salvation, but to prepare the way for the return of your Son. In his name, the name who saved us, the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 10. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 10. Verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. This is Hanukkah. Hanukkah. Hanukkah means dedication in Hebrew. The Feast of Dedication. The first issue, you will see people saying things like, Christmas, we don't know what year it was, we don't know what day it was, it was a pagan holy day, therefore we should not celebrate it, it's wrong to celebrate Christmas, we shouldn't do it, it's not scriptural. Well, the people who say this have a problem. This is the first problem. The first problem is Hanukkah was not decreed as a holiday or holy day to be observed in the Torah. It was not in the list of Hebrew holy days of Leviticus 23 or 24. It was something that was added by historical tradition. Nonetheless, the Lord Jesus observed it, celebrated it, and applied it to himself messianically. You cannot automatically conclude that the observance of a holy day is wrong if it has no clear scriptural mandate. Now, Hanukkah does have a scriptural mandate in that the events of Hanukkah are predicted in the book of Daniel. But their historical fulfillment is in the historical books of 1st and 2nd Maccabees, in the apocryphal literature. The apocrypha is not canon. It's not a basis of doctrine. It is nonetheless biblically important history and literature. I'll say it again. Apocrypha is not a basis of doctrine in and of itself, but it is scripturally important history and literature. The prophecies of Daniel concerning Hanukkah are fulfilled in history and recorded in 1st and 2nd Maccabees. Jesus, knowing this, being a Jew of that time and culture, observed Hanukkah. He observed what some people would argue was an extra-biblical holy day. Now, strictly speaking, it was not extra-biblical. This is not the only one. To this day, Jews celebrate Purim, the Feast of Esther. Neither was the Feast of Esther or Purim one of the original holy days that God decreed through Moses. That is their first problem. Their second problem, however, is looking at the holy days that God did decree in Leviticus 23 and 24. Although there are multiple meanings to those holy days, they foreshadow Christ, their picture of something called Heil's Geschichte, salvation history. They foreshadow prophetic events in the history of salvation and both the first and second coming of Christ. They are also within their own cultural setting, or Sitzimleben, polemics against paganism. The Canaanites had holy days, those same days of the year that God told the Hebrews to celebrate. These holy days were based around the annual agricultural cycle. Only instead of thanking Yahweh for the rain, the sun, the harvest, and things like that, they were thanking pagan gods, who Moses called demons. Shadim, idols, other gods are demons. Paul says the same thing. Other gods are demons, uh, demonoi in Greek. What God did was he superimposed a scriptural meaning on top of the pagan one to displace the pagan with the scriptural. He wanted his people to thank him for the rain and the sun and the harvest. Yet many of the details of the observation of the, of the observances culturally and ritually were similar. That's why God told the Hebrews, be careful to do all that I tell you. It was not the similarities alone that were important. It was the differences. It was the differences. <clears throat> I was once at a temple that existed in the time of Moses in Erdfu, Egypt. It had an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies into which the high priest entered only once a year. Only he was the high priest of Osiris, not of Yahweh. Outward similarities do not invalidate in and of themselves. We have to be very careful in judging scripturally. 
their third problem, and the problem that comes into the church is found in Colossians chapter 2 and in Romans 14, 4 and 5. Colossians chapter 2, 16 to 19. Okay. Let no one be your judge in regard to a festival, a new moon, or a Sabbath. These things are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay. Let no one judge you for what holy days or what days you observe or worship. Romans 14, 4 and 5 gives the opposite caveat. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls. One man esteems one day, one another. Another all days alike, let each be fully convinced in his own mind. The observances of Sabbaths and of holy days are a matter of personal choice, conscience, and culture. Now, the danger comes when we bring paganistic ideas into the church that are alien to the teaching of Scripture. That's an issue. That's a problem. Absolutely. It's a grounds for spiritual seduction. But the idea of the days themselves and observing the days, that's wrong. This is absolutely crazy. Now, I do have something more of a problem with Easter than Christmas because Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and 1 Corinthians all make it clear that Jesus did not die Good Friday, nor did he raise from the dead Easter Sunday. These things happened on Erev Hag, for Pesach, and he rose from the dead, Yom Rishon of Hag Matzot, the Sunday, the first day of the week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. All four Gospels plus 1 Corinthians confirm that. Easter is definitely a pagan day <coughs> from Ashtaroth worship, and it has uh, nothing in common with, with, with when the Lord rose. He, wrote, he died and rose according to the Hebrew lunar calendar, not the solar calendar. Easter was the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. It was a pagan holy day. It was moved with the quadridecimian schism in the early church centuries after the time of the apostles when the church was trying to uncouple itself from its Hebraic origins. Easter is something of a problem theologically based on what it says in the New Testament. Christmas, we don't know the day or the year. However, we know about the Nativity, and the Nativity is one of the most important events in human history. Uh, not as important as the Parousia, not as important as the death and resurrection, but certainly it would probably be third place, or at least a major contender for it. Had there not been a Nativity, there would not be a death and resurrection, or a salvation, or a return of Christ, because he wouldn't have come the first time. Nonetheless, be careful. You've got now people teaching about the insignificance of the nativity, such as Andy Stanley, Charles Stanley's son. That guy is dangerous. He's teaching nothing but error. He is a dangerous person. He's a very seriously dangerous false teacher, as Andy Stanley, and his father lets him run amok. <clears throat> There's been all kinds of problems in that family that became public knowledge, with the son fighting with the father over the divorce of his mother, and it just was all one scandal after another that got into the public domain and everyone saw it, which was terrible. And now the kid's teaching error and the father's promoting his ministry. It's very, very unfortunate. I have no respect or regard anymore for Charles Stanley. In fact, because he'd been on TBN, I didn't have a high view of him to begin with, which was tragic. 30, 40 years ago, that man taught the word of God faithfully. 30, 40 years ago, that same man taught the word of God faithfully. Probably the best sermon I ever heard on the subject of prayer was delivered by Charles Stanley some years ago at a prayer conference in Dallas. I watched the film of it. Uh, let it be a warning to people like me. If Charles Stanley can go off, I can go off. Don't follow men, follow Jesus. As Paul said, you can be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Do not be an imitator of Jacob Prash. Be an imitator of Jesus. You can follow me to the exact extent I follow him. You can trust me to the exact extent I trust him. You can agree with me to the exact extent what I expound agrees with his word. That's essentially it. And so we have the issue of the day itself. Jesus is observing a day that was not in the original Hebrew <coughs> liturgical holy days from the book of Leviticus. But let's go further. The 25th of... December was the Roman feast of Saturnalia, a pagan feast, Saturnalia. The Hebrew lunar month <coughs> corresponding to December is the month of Kislev, Kislev. What day is Hanukkah, the first day of Hanukkah? 25th of 
Kislev. And this particular year, 2016, Anno Domine, this year, the 25th of December and the 25th of Kislev <laughs> are the same. Hanukkah begins on Christmas Eve this year, same, quite a thing. That happens every so often when the two calendars become congruent. So such is it. Be very careful about the holiday background. Jesus observed a non-canonical holiday. Jesus observed it. So if you're going to judge people for doing that, you're going to have to judge Jesus. Why did he do it? He's our perfect example. We have to be careful with this issue of holy days, about being judgmental. There are things that are obviously wrong that can get into the church that are of pagan origin. Nonetheless, we can't make a blanket statement that it's wrong to have the holy day itself. God imposed a theologically correct interpretation on the religious festivals of the agricultural cycle of the ancient Near East. God imposed them and told the Hebrews to observe them. So let's go further with this now. People talk about Father Christmas. In some countries, Father Christmas, Santa Claus, he's called in England Father Christmas, or Santa Claus in England where I live. In some countries, he's the same as St. Nicholas. In other countries, like Holland, there are two different figures, two different people. There's a St. Nicholas Day, the 14th of December, and then there's Christmas. Uh, as Marsh Rosen once said, Santa Claus <clears throat> is a communist. He dresses in red and only gives away other things other people pay for. <laughs> uh, there is definitely an antichrist spirit on back of Santa Claus because it takes the focus off Christ and puts it on Santa Claus, okay? And on, tells children it's about receiving material gifts and material wealth. It just displaces the real meaning of the nativity. Personally, I like the nativity. I don't like Christmas. Now, this is not to put down the historical St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas was the bishop or the senior pastor of the church in Ephesus in the 5th century during the final Roman persecution, uh, Greco-Roman persecution. During the final persecution of, of the church by the pagans in Ephesus, he was the leader of the church. He was in prison for his faith, and by historical tradition, he had a reputation for love for the poor and for children, and also for sailors, for sailors. It was a seafaring faring city, and he was a patron of, of, of sailors, but he was known for his charity and love for children and the poor. There's no problem with St. Nicholas, but St. Nicholas bears little resemblance to Santa Claus. <laughs> He's just another guy who was persecuted. He, nobody can say anything bad about St. Nicholas. What happens to St. Nicholas is something different. Ephesus was an epicenter of this. It was at the Council of Ephesus in the fifth century where Diana of Ephesus had been worshipped, that Mary, Miriam, the mother of Jesus, was proclaimed Queen of Heaven. Now, Jeremiah warns about they'll be sacrificing cakes to the Queen of Heaven, this <laughs> demonic worship that went back to the worship of Artemis. <laughs> and, uh, you know, great, great as Artemis of, of Ephesus. It was obviously a place of pagan worship, <clears throat> and the attributes of this pagan goddess Artemis were ascribed to Mary, and the two became conflated and confused at Ephesus. Ephesus was a place where this kind of eclecticism and hybriding of Christendom, of, of, of Christianity with paganism took place, producing Christendom, from which the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church evolved. What we have today, after the time of Constantine and what followed it, is not actual Christianity for the most part, it is Christendom. Christendom was a hybrid of the religions of the Greco-Roman Empire and their pagan culture associated with it, somehow blended into the teachings of the New Testament, minus the Jewish origins. So first Satan managed to strip away the sense that Jesus was a Jewish Messiah, salvation comes from the Jews, uncouple the church from its Judaic source, and then replace that with Hellenism and the paganistic aspects of Hellenism, this came into place at, at, at Ephesus, okay? Well, there was nothing wrong with Mary. There was nothing wrong with Miriam, the mother of Christ. We looked at her the other day, on Wednesday, in her introduction in the Magnificat. Very positive figure, the greatest woman who ever lived. 
but what became of her, what was done with her, the distortion of Mary, is what you have today. You've got this blonde bimbo, you know, this imposter, this represents being the mother of Christ. Well, that's not the real medium of the scripture. Well, it's the same with St. Nicholas and Santa Claus. Santa Claus is not the St. Nicholas from Ephesus. Ephesus seemed to become an epicenter of these kinds of things, with good reason. Ephesus had been the base of the apostles in Asia Minor. Ephesus had become the base of the apostles in Asia Minor. Peter, Paul, Barnabas, they were all associated with Ephesus. It's believed that that's where the apostle John is buried. I've stood at what they believe to be the place he was buried many times after he returned from the Patmos during the exile of, of uh, Domitian. He was buried there by his historical record, or at least historical tradition. Uh, what a better place for Satan to begin to dilute Christianity, hybriding it with paganism after the time of Constantine the Great and the post-Nicene Church Fathers. This came from there. Well, tremendous problems have happened as a result with Mary, with, with, with the Nativity. We know all that. But we cannot discount or invalidate the observance of a day simply because the pagans have a holy day on the same day, or simply because uh, it has no direct biblical warrant or command to observe it. We can't do that. We simply cannot do that. It's not what Jesus did. He observed the day. So thus we look at John 10, 22, at that time. What precedes it and what follows it takes place at Hanukkah. We'll be looking at Hanukkah in our second session. But Hanukkah is the Hebrew feast of miracles and light. The Hebrew feast of miracles and light is Hanukkah. Today it is celebrated as the Feast of the Maccabees, with children playing a game with a top called the dreidel in Yiddish, or the tsevivon in Hebrew, with an acronym, one letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Neskadol Hayapo, a great miracle happened here. And there's festive foods like latkes and kind of jam don jelly like donuts called souvganiot, and, and there's songs and things like this, and the story of the Maccabees. But it's an important, it's an important cultural and religious day in Jewish culture uh, globally, uh, and certainly in Israel. And Jesus observed it. He observed Hanukkah. This is a Hanukkah. It is not an ordinary candelabra. Again, by the historical tradition, when the Maccabees rededicated the temple that was defiled by the Seleucids, as we'll see in the next session, they had enough oil only for one day. Normally, a candelabra looks like that. It has seven, as you see in Revelation chapter 1, as you see in the Torah, seven. But Hanukkah, it burned eight days. The central one is called the shamash, the servant candle or the deacon, literally the deacon, shamash. You light that one. Hanukkah was on eight days. The first day you light one, the second day you light two, third day you light three, fourth day four, all the way till you get to the end, okay? The central one is the one that gives light to the others, hence the background of Jesus identifying himself as the light of the world. He's the only one who's elevated above the others, and he gives light, <laughs> he gives his light to the others. Hanukkah is always identified by having nine stems, nine instead of the conventional seven, okay. We also know, thy words a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. The imagery of it is associated with the lamp. Nonetheless, let's look now. Let's begin at John chapter nine. We've explained before the homotosphere, the fallen world, Sin and death have come as a result of sin in the broad sense. However, we cannot say that every malady, every illness or infirmity is the result of a specific sin. It may or it may not be. In John chapter 5, where Jesus heals the paralytic, 
The chap obviously had some kind of a dystrophy in his extremities. It may have been an STD of the kind that still exists in the Middle East and Africa and Asia to this day, where paralysis results from sexually communicated diseases. That may have been it because Jesus told him, sin no more, sin no more. That was obviously a case where whatever happened to him was the consequence of, 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 of some sin. Let's look, please, to Psalm 32. Verse 3, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. When I kept silent about my sin, again, a sin may result in an illness. The Lord may use the illness as an instrument to bring about repentance. We see this in the epistle of James. Let's look to James, please, in the New Testament, which was, of course, written to Jewish believers. James chapter 5, verse 14, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. It does not say that he did, it just says if. There are cases where sin can result in illness or where the Lord will use illness as an instrument of correction in the life of his people to get them to repent. <coughs> One of the things we look at then is the subject, I only mentioned it relative to Hanukkah, is healing in the atonement. Is healing in the atonement. By his stripes we are healed, hallelujah. And you've got the word faith, money preachers running around telling people to claim a healing and if they don't get healed, they're put under condemnation and told it's because they don't have any faith. This is ridiculous. Is healing in the atonement? Yes, but understand this. Healing is in the atonement in the following way. The resurrection or the rapture, the glorified body. No matter what's wrong with you, I guarantee it's not going to be wrong with you when Jesus comes back. Yeah, it is. Now, we may have a foretaste of this in this life. One of the ways we may have a foretaste of it is if the Lord is using illness to draw our attention to unconfessed sin, that it may be repented of, and then we repent of the sin and go through the ritual of the anointing with the elders. And yeah, in and, and that case also, healing is in the atonement but it is not guaranteed before the rapture or resurrection. Even if the Lord does heal you from your lumbago or whatever you've got, <laughs> you're still going to become, unless the Lord returns first, you're still going to become elderly. Your health is going to break down and you're going to check out. Yes, healing's in the atonement, but it's the resurrection. Be careful of the hyper-faith teaching. Yes, healing is in the atonement as the scripture teaches it's in the atonement. It is not in the atonement the way the con artist money preachers tell you. I think of Frederick Christ telling people, the, the money preacher, uh, if you're sick, you think the Holy Spirit wants to live in a broken down house? His own wife was battling cancer when he said that. I think of the late Kenneth, Kenneth Hagin, he went on television and he said because of his faith, he didn't have a, a, a headache in 45 years. Perhaps not, but he had four clinically documented cardiovascular failures. No wonder he didn't have a headache. He was too busy having heart attacks. You know? <laughs> this was Hagen. These guys are a bunch of con artists. They are con artists. And the people who believe them are ignorant. I have said this before. The, world, the word faith teaches are spiritual whores. And the money preachers are their pimps. The word faith teachers are spiritual whores, and the money preachers, the mammon worshipers, are their pimps. They are not teaching faith in Jesus. They are teaching faith in faith. They are not worshiping the Lord. They are worshiping mammon. They call the sin of covetousness faith. Now, this is in no way to deny the power of the Lord to intervene supernaturally and bring healing. He can, and praise God, he does when it's his purpose. 
And I guarantee for all those whose faith is truly in Jesus, no matter what's wrong with you or with me, we will one day be totally healed. It is in the atonement, as Scripture teaches it. However, in the mentality of the ancient Near East and of the Jews, there were certain maladies, as, maladies, as we pointed out before, that people associated with a curse of God or sin. We talked about this in the past. Infertility would have been one of them because there would have been no Yerusha, the inheritance. God actually ordained Leverite marriage to procreate children on behalf of a dead brother to perpetuate the Yerusha and take care of the widow. We talked about that in the introduction the other night. That would have been one. Another would have been leprosy because long before people knew about microbiology, God knew about communicable disease. And he ordered the Levitical priest to carry out medical inspections and quarantine people who had communicable disease, leprosy. Leprosy was rife in the ancient Near East. It slaughtered populations, but it didn't happen to the Hebrews if they followed the Torah. None of these diseases I will put on you if you keep my... Well, again, at that time, without refrigeration and proper processing of foods, if you refrained from shellfish and pork products, you didn't have to worry about trigonosis and botulism, obviously. <laughs> okay, now there's a spiritual meaning, a typology to those foods. You know, cast not your pearl before swine and things like that. They, they, they're pictures of things. Spiritual, we explain this on our teaching kashrut and famine, but they had a literal medical meaning or a public health meaning. So too was leprosy. Leprosy was a figure of sin and judgment for sin, and the quarantining of a uh, leper would have put them outside of the community of worship. They couldn't worship with other people. Okay. Uh, there were other things like this that would have seen as curses. We talked about infertility and leprosy. Another one was ritual impurity, ritual impurity or the sexual inadequacies that went with it. People are born biologically to reproduce, so they are born again to reproduce. We are born again to lead others to Christ, okay? Hence, if a male suffered crushed genitals, he would be excluded from the community of worship. It was, would have seen as a curse of God if you, if you if, if, if you were emasculated, you would have been, due to an accident, uh, due to trauma, you would have been excommunicated, as it were, from the community. It would have been a big problem. Now, that was an issue. Well, also, uh, ritual impurity, tahor lo tahor, uh, vaginal bleeding. There, was, there is, even with Orthodox Jewish women to this day, a ritual bathing ritual called a mikvah. Um, but that woman who had the consistent vaginal bleeding that went on for years and years and years and years who touched Jesus, it says she suffered the pain of many physicians. Those who have looked at that text with the medical eye believe it was probably some form of endometriosis. When it said she suffered the pain of many physicians, they weren't joking. There was no cauterization. There was no anticoagulant drugs. There was nothing like that. You couldn't cauterize. There was no surgery, nothing. They actually <laughs> internally applied hot irons to try to seal the skin to stop the bleeding. Why would somebody undergo that kind of agony? Well, because you were socially ostracized. You couldn't worship in the temple. You were excommunicated from the community of faith. So when this woman touches Jesus, you couldn't touch a woman who was ritually impure. She made him impure, and that, you know what I'm saying? He took our diseases in figure, she put the thing on him, and then she gets cured. And he feels the power going out from her. He bore our infirmities, that, that's what it's illustrating. Now she was able to worship God again. <laughs> when, when she touched him, then he became unclean, and she became clean. He took our sin. He became unclean when he took our sin. We can worship the Father in spirit and truth. We can come before God only because Jesus took our sin. That's what is illustrated. We're no longer ritually impure before God. There's always a meaning. When you see these healings, there's always a meaning. We've ex usually to do with salvation, or always to do with salvation in some way. Remember the paralytic again at the Pool of Bethesda in John 5. Jesus tells him, pick up his pallet 
and go his way. Why did he need the pallet? If somebody is, my apologies to those who know this. If somebody is healed of polio, he doesn't need to get back in his wheelchair. You know, if the Lord healed my lymphoedema, I wouldn't need those crutches hanging on the podium back there. Uh, you know, wh why would Jesus heal my lymphoedema and tell me to pick up my crutches? Well, why did Jesus heal that paralytic and tell him to pick up his pallet? Because it was the piece of wood to which his flesh was confined. Pick up your cross and follow me. Live a crucified life, sin no more. There's always a meaning an illustration of salvation in these healing miracles of Jesus. Well, we can talk about all of these things, but not least of all, what would have been seriously seen as having been caused by some sin would have been blindness, blindness. Again, in the ancient Near East, literacy was generally for the nobility, for the aristocracy, for royalty, for pagan priesthoods and military commanders. With the Hebrews not, every Jew had to read the Torah. The Levites had to make sure that every Jew, every Hebrew, was literate and numerate. When it says the apostles were uneducated men in Acts 4.13, they were uneducated by Jewish standards. By the standards of the pagan world, they would have been quite educated simply because they were literate and numerate. <laughs> if you were blind, there was no Braille in those days, no electronic books. Obviously, if you were blind, you couldn't read the Torah. You couldn't read the Torah. Once a Jewish male was 13, had bar mitzvah, he reads the Torah. You couldn't read the Torah if you were blind. If you reached the age of manhood to read the Torah, and you were blind, it's like you never became a man. You were always a boy. You were... <laughs> Not only that, but you couldn't worship in the, in, in the synagogue or in the temple because of blind. This would have been seen as a big, big deal. This was their thinking. Let's look now with this background in view. Everybody understand the cultural background, the way they looked at healing and diseases. There were certain diseases that they believed only the Messiah could cure, that were emblematic of his messiahship. Ironically, raising the dead was not one of them because Elijah did that. They believed only the Messiah could make a blind person see or a deaf person hear. To this day, you know, neurons don't regenerate. They can be damaged and healed, the dendrites can heal, can re -knit. But once a neuron is dead, it's dead. Nerves, nervous tissue does not regenerate once it undergoes ne full necrosis. It, it's non-regenerative. If the optic nerve is dead, that person is not going to see again. They're trying to do things like with nanotechnology to transmit light impressions now <clears throat> that can interact uh, organically with organic microchips that can interact with what's left of the nerve root tissue. They're trying to do things like this to see some kind of an image. And they're making a little bit of progress. But essentially, once nerve tissue is gone, it's gone. Once the audio nerve is dead, that person was not going to hear again. Once the optical nerve is dead, that person was not going to um, see again. They believed only the Messiah could restore this. So when Jesus made a blind person see or a deaf person hear, it was emblematic of his Messiahship. Only the Messiah could do this. This was a big deal. Now let's look. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus said it was neither this man who sinned nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now here the term works is synonymous with miraculous. We must work the works of him who sent me. Notice, not just I must, we must. Yeah. As long as it is day, night is coming when no man can work. Remember, with the partial exception of John 16, John does not have anything like the Olivet Discourse. It does not have a teaching about the return of Jesus. John instead is punctuated with references to the return of Christ. It's punctuated with references to the return of Christ in the individual pericopes and narratives. Here, work while you have the day, night is coming. Remember, he's coming like a thief in the night. 
okay, he's coming like a thief in the night. You have a great spiritual darkness at the end of the age. The bridegroom comes for the bride in the night in the Song of Solomon and in Matthew 25, with the wise and foolish virgins. Watchmen, watchmen, how far is the night? Is he coming in the second watch of the night or the third? He's coming like a thief in the night. Work while you have the light. Night will come when no one can work. Well, I am in the world. I am the light of the world. That is the background of Hanukkah. He's talking about this, the light that gives light to the other ones. He's drawing on the imagery of the festival. Then he continues. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of spittle and applied the clay to the eyes. Whenever you see the Lord going down and making something out of the earth, the term earth is Adama in Hebrew. It comes from the root word red. In the, if you've been to Israel, if it's not sand, there's a reddish clay in the soil. <laughs> okay. Anthropologists tell us North American Indians have a tradition that the first man was a red man. They're right. Okay. God made Adam out of the earth. Right. Because of the fall, man is blind, spiritually blind. These illnesses all illustrate our fallen state. We are all deaf until we hear his voice. John 10 tells us, my sheep hear my voice. We are all blind till we see the light. We are all lame until he empowers us to walk in the spirit. When you see Jesus getting down and making something out of the clay, it shows the same God who made man is going to remake man, creation and new creation. That's the entire John motif, the entire Midrash going back to the creation in Genesis. Now, most of you know this. Is there anyone who does not know what I'm talking about? Do all of you know what I'm talking about? Who does not know what I'm talking about? If a Jewish believer was reading John's gospel in the first century, particularly the opening chapters, he would have said, this is a midrash on the creation in Genesis. In the Septuagint, in the beginning, Breshit, in the beginning, John's gospel opens the same way. Anarche, in the beginning. Okay. God walks the earth in the creation in Genesis. God walks the earth in the new creation in John. God comes to separate the light from dark in the creation in Genesis. He separates the light from dark in the new creation in John. Okay. The spirit moves on the water and brings forth the creation in Genesis, born of the water and the spirit. Spirit moves on the water and brings forth the new creation in John. You got the small light and the great light in the creation in Genesis. So you've got Yohanan HaMatbil, John the Baptist, the small light, and Jesus, the great light in the new creation in John, okay? Uh, on the third day in Genesis, God does a miracle with water. So in John chapter 2, at the wedding of Canaan, it's the third day, it says, and he does the miracle with water, six being the number of man, okay? You understand what I'm saying? It's always shown creation and new creation. In Judaism, the fig tree represents the tree of life, the Eid Saim. So you've got the, the fig tree in Genesis. Jesus tells Nathaniel, how do you know me? I saw you under the fig tree. What Jesus was telling Nathaniel in Jewish metaphor is, I saw you from the creation, from the foundation of the world, from, from the garden. When somebody's born again, you know, Jesus saw you under the fig tree. He saw me under the fig tree. When you were born again, he already knew, knew who you were from the foundation of the world. He saw you under the tree of life. John is always key to show the relationship between creation and new creation. That the world was made through him, through Jesus. Is how, when Adam heard God walking in the garden, that was Jesus. Now that same God is walking, walking the earth again. God made man from the earth. Now God's going to make a new man. You understand? So he gets down and he takes up the word. Everybody understand? You got it? I know most of you know this stuff. Oh, let's continue. Okay. 
And he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which translated means sent. It's the word for apostle, Shiloach, the one who was sent. Well excavated, 80% of it's excavated today. The original one is now well excavated, well worth visiting. Incredible place. And so he went away and washed and came back seeing. Notice the restoration of his sight was not spontaneous. It was progressive. Sometimes when the Lord heals people, it is not instantaneous. It's progressive. But the restoration of his sight was in proportion to his compliance with the instructions of Jesus. Go wash in the pool of Shaloach. When somebody becomes a new creation, what's the first thing they should do? They baptize it. <laughs> The more you act in what Jesus tells you to do, the more you're going to see. <laughs> he's not going to show us any more until we act on what he's already shown us. <laughs> Everybody understand? Let's continue. And he came back seen. The neighbors, therefore, and those who previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who used to sit and beg? Others were saying, this is he. Others saying, no, but he's, he's like him. And he kept saying, I'm the one. Do not expect unsaved people who knew you before you met Jesus to be able to make sense out of what happened to you. Now, if you grew up in a Christian family and you got saved as a kid and you were fortunate enough to have believing parents or believing parents and you know, the bedtime stories were always David and Goliath and Mary and Martha and all of that. And, you, and Sunday school, and you came to faith as a kid, you, you, you can't relate to it in the same way. But if you got saved out of the world, if you were somebody who did not grow up as a believer, and you got saved, and, and, and don't expect people who knew you before you were saved to be able to figure out what happened to you. They just don't get it. The wind blows where it wills, so was everyone born of the Spirit of God. The world can't figure out Jesus. It can't figure out. So they're not going to be able to figure you out either. This isn't him. This is somebody. Jacob Prash was a communist. He was a cocaine dealer in New York. He was crazy. He wanted to be, he literally wanted to be a mad scientist as a kid. The guy was a nut. <laughs> That's not him. He's <laughs> had that, that guy standing on the street corner in New York with the gospel tracks, preaching the gospel, that's not him. He used to stand on the corner in Greenwich Village and deal cocaine. <laughs> they don't get it. Don't expect them to get it. Don't expect them to get it. Therefore they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? And he said, the man who's called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said, go to Siloam and wash. So I went straight away and I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I don't know. They brought him to the Pharisees who was formerly blind. Now it was a Sabbath day on the day that Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And therefore the Pharisees also were asking him, how he received his sight. And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man's not from God. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Remember, they believed only the Messiah could make a blind person see. Only the Messiah. Wherever the power and truth of Jesus comes into a situation, expect there to be division. Oh, there's going to be wonderful unity. No, there's going to be an ugly division. He said, I didn't come to bring, I came to bring the sword. When he comes back, there's going to be a lovely unity. In his second coming, he's going to bring peace. Not in his first coming. He's separating those who are his from those who are not. Even though the Pharisees professed to be his. Division will always happen among those who profess to believe. 
wherever the truth is proclaimed, the truth of Jesus is proclaimed, the vision will result. Even among people who all say we believe in him. It will often pit you against the religious leadership. I saw this time and time again with the, like the counterfeit revivals in Toronto and Pensacola. This is not a revival, it's not script, the vision. And the leadership going against the people who said it was false. Let's look. They said therefore to the blind man in verse 17, what do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, he's a prophet. The Jews therefore, now understand you have a translation issue of the word Judeoi. They were all Jewish. It doesn't mean people were Jewish. It meant the Judeans, the religious establishment in and around Jerusalem. You understand? It meant the religious establishment. In modern Israel, in Tel Aviv and Haifa, there are far less religious Jews than there are in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, the religious have a, a much stronger grip on the local government and things like that. Well, it was the same way in biblical times, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees had much more of a grip on the area in and around Jerusalem, the Judeans. Therefore did not believe him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight and questioned them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how? does he now see? And his parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and he was born blind, but how he sees we do not know, or who opened his eyes we do not know. Ask him, he is, he is of age, he shall speak for himself. He was 13, thereabout. Why? Because he is of age. He couldn't read the Torah previously, now he can read, you understand? Same as when Jesus came to the temple, remember? And he confounded the so-called wise men of the temples. And his mother said this, I'm thinking about my father's business. That didn't happen until he was bar mitzvah age, the age of manhood, you understand? My children, bar mitzvah for a girl, bar mitzvah for a son. Up to that age, my children ate kosher. After that, they could eat shrimp if they wanted to. It was their choice. Up to that age, they had to attend the same church my wife and myself did. After then, they, as long as it was a biblically-based church, they could go to the church they wanted. It's, it's an important age in the Jewish culture. They be, parents remain parents, but the primary relationship or responsibility for the relationship with God shifts from their parents to them. Up to bar mitzvah age, their parents are primarily responsible for their relationship with the Lord. After bar mitzvah, then it shifts primarily to them. That's not to say there's not a parental role in terms of guidance and things like that. There is. It says that Jesus remained in subject to his parents. But he also says, it's about time I went about my father's business. That's the idea of the bar mitzvah. That's what happened with Jesus at this age. That's what happens with this kid at this age. You understand the Jewish background? Let's read. His parents said this because they were afraid of the religious establishment, the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess him to be the Messiah, he'd be put out of the synagogue. <laughs> Boy, what will they think down at the synagogue? What will they think down at the mass? What will they think down at the... <laughs> Is your loyalty going to be to God or to a religious institution? <laughs> I see this repeated with Jews, I see it with Muslims who get saved, Jehovah, people in cults, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, these are big issues. In Ireland and in Latin America, it's a big issue with Catholics. It's a big issue with Catholics. Is the loyalty going to be to the religious establishment, to the religious institution in which you grew up, or is it going to be to the Lord? For this reason, his parents said he's of age, ask him. So a second time they called the young man who'd been born, had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know this man's a sinner. 
And he therefore answered, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, now I see. They said, therefore, to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I told you already. You didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You don't want to become his disciples too, do you? <laughs> The Holy Spirit will even give a young believer utterance. The Holy Spirit will even give a newly saved person utterance. It will come from the Lord, not from them. Remember what Jesus said when they bring you before governors and kings, don't consider what you're going to say ahead of time. <laughs> even a newly saved person will have that utterance. My wife had been saved about a week, and I led her to the Lord, but I flew back to New York. She was in, in, in Israel. And the devil does what the devil often does. This is in Israel. Jehovah's Witnesses. She didn't know anything. She just knew Jesus was the Messiah. She's born again. <laughs> She's been saved a week. There about. They come in with their rubbish. Right away, you know, this devil sends the sheep nappers. <laughs> and she didn't know why she just opened, and she, and she looked at Hebrews chapter 1. So which of the angels did he say? <laughs> I don't know God is for... The Jehovah's Witnesses couldn't answer it. They said, we have to come back with our elders. They didn't show up. She'd only been saved a week. Right from the beginning, the good shepherd carries the lambs. Right from the beginning. Sanhedrin couldn't answer the question. Well, let's look at it. I told you. They reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he's from. And the man answered and said, well, here's an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from. And yet he opened my eyes. Now understand, they thought, they believed only the Messiah could do that. They were thrown into a crisis. We know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Since the beginning of time, it's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, you were born entirely in your sins and you are teaching us? And they put him out. This is a guy who was saved five minutes. But this is a guy who, who met the Lord five minutes ago. Saved in the Old Testament sense, you know. He met the Lord five minutes <laughs> <laughs> Look what he's saying. He's confounding the wise men. Now, what did Jesus do when he was born? That's for age. In the temple, he confounded the wise men, didn't he? They were astounded at what he was saying. It's the same thing. You're born of the spirit of Jesus. Now, notice this guy said, this is what happened to me. Here's my testimony. But he didn't base his belief on what happened to him. He just said what happened to him. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they put him out. And finding him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, and he said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, you've both seen him, and he's the one talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. This was another one of those verses the Jehovah's Witnesses don't like. The word is prosciutto. Jesus received worship. Not did obeyance. He received worship. Okay. He doesn't worship him until Jesus gives him the word. Well, let's look. You've both seen. Somebody who was blind now sees. Jesus found him. If somebody is rejected, 
for their faith in Jesus. If somebody comes to a saving faith in Jesus and they're rejected by their family and their community, and again, this happens many places. The week before last, I was in Vietnam. I met the pastor of a church in a tribal region where there was persecution. There was this one guy, this is the week before last now, there's this one guy and his daughter are alive. The local communist officials stirred up a persecution and they set his house on fire. They killed his wife and four children. They killed his wife and four children. This is two weeks ago. I was in Vietnam. I talked to his pastor. They killed the guy's wife and four children. This is reality. This happens to people. This happens to Christians today. Men of whom the world is not worthy. Jesus said this. Men of whom the world is... And this guy, this poor And they worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I came into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. He made the Sanhedrin blind. He opened the eyes of the common people, the Am Ha'aretz, the people of the land. One of the reasons the Sanhedrin hated Jesus, they used their knowledge and edu religious education to create a social and financial and politically influential power base for themselves. When Jesus took the keys to understanding the scripture and gave it to fishermen, <laughs> he took away their keys to privilege and position. That's what he did. He gave it to the Amaharats, the people of the land. The Sanhedrin looked down upon them. These people don't know the Torah. We do. We're the, who are you to question us? Oh. Hold me what you see today. Except today, <laughs> many of the people saying that don't even know the scriptures themselves. <laughs> Those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things and said to him, we're not blind too, are we? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you'd have no sin. But since you say, we see, your sin remains. If you were blind, you'd have no sin. Understand this. The scriptures tell us, blessed is the one who the Lord does not take their sin into account. There are two aspects of this. One are those whose sins are forgiven because Jesus took the blame and paid the price for a sin. Sin is not taken into account. The other are people who do not have the means to know. Babies. If somebody has a Down syndrome child, that's a tremendous burden that God has placed on you. It's a tremendous burden and responsibility to have a Down syndrome child. But you have something. You have a guarantee that that child is going to heaven. <laughs> you have a guarantee that other people don't necessarily have. Okay. There are actually some extreme Calvinists who teach that babies who die before being the age of, of being able to be regenerate, go to hell. I, I, I have no cases where they, they teach this craziness. Jesus said, well, the children come to me, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They had no means to know to sin. A baby wants attention, kicks up a fuss, screams, just wants attention, demands it. Now that's evidence of the sinful nature of man. That's evidence of the fallen sinful nature of man, but the baby has no sense of it. Not until the age of reason. Now, for the Jews, that was <coughs> bar mitzvah age. It was bar mitzvah age. Okay. Well, what happened was this with the Maccabees. There was a division among the clergy. Many of the clergy were collaborating in order to preserve their own interests, they were collaborating with the Seleucids, okay? In the time of Jesus, the same thing happened. The high priesthood came under the control of the Sadducees. The ancestors of the Sadducees, the sons of Zadok, Sadukim, Sadducim, the Sadducees, were righteous men who became corrupted in the Hasmonean period. Okay? So too, 
you had the Herodians and the Sadducees. They were Roman collaborators. The religious leadership of the Hebrews was divided, with some of them in control being Seleucid collaborators with Antiochus. So too in the time of Jesus, the same thing happens. You had within the Sanhedrin those who were Roman collaborators with the Herodians. Everybody understand? These were the false shepherds of Israel. Jesus comes against this background of Hanukkah and says, we're the true shepherds. With the division that happened at Hanukkah, the Maccabees were a priestly family who would not collaborate with the Seleucids, okay? They were the faithful shepherds who went against the establishment, as it were, okay? The Jews believed, they expected a Messiah to come and get rid of the Romans the way the Maccabees got rid of the Greeks, the Seleucids, you understand? They were looking for a political military Messiah who would depose the Romans as the Maccabees deposed the Greek Seleucids. Much as the temple had been defiled, the Romans built the fortress Antonio over the temple on the Temple Mount on the north side of it with the pagan ensigns and the eagles, Roman eagles, overtowering the house of God. This was an affront to their nationhood and peoplehood. And it has a lot to do with the background of the triumphal entry. They wanted the Messiah to come through the East Gate, make a right turn, and get rid of the Romans. Instead, he, at the Port of Zantonia, instead he makes a left turn, goes into Solomon's portico, and gets rid of Joyce Meyer and Benny Hinn. <laughs> this was the problem. You understand, they had this messianic expectation that the Messiah would be like the Maccabees, that there was a division in their leadership. Now Jesus comes and he tells us there's three kinds of pastors. We've explained this before on the Psalm 23 recording and others. Good shepherds who are like Jesus. Should the need arise, they'd lay down their life for the sheep. Second, wolves in sheep's clothing. Third category. The third category of leaders are neither wolves in sheep's clothing nor are they good shepherds. They are hirelings. Hire. The ministry has become their job, their profession, their career, at best their vocation, but not their calling from God. Their priorities will always be their own position their salary, their pension, their accommodation allowance, their credentials, their standing in the community, their whatever, their hirelings. Jesus tells us, how do you tell the difference between a pastor who is a good shepherd and one who is a hireling? Quite simply, the hireling will not protect the sheep from the wolves. In the time of the Maccabees, not all of the priesthood was collaborating with the Seleucids. Many of them just went along with it. Today, it's the same thing. There are many pastors of churches who know what's wrong. It's not saying that they sanction or endorse what's wrong, but they will never protect the sheep from it. They will never stand up and warn the flock Keep away from him. He's a deceiver. They will never do what the apostles did. They will never say, look out for Alexander the coppersmith or Hymenaeus. Look out for Philippus or Diotrephes. They will never name the name publicly of those who are seducing the church. They come up with some religious hogwash cop-out line, at best rooted in ignorance, but more likely rooted in cowardice and self-aggrandizing motivation. It goes like this. We just have to teach the truth. The Lord will deal with the error. If that's the case, most of the Hebrew prophets never should have written anything. 
First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and Galatians never should have been written. <laughs> Among other books. It's just not scriptural. Hirelings will never protect the sheep from the wolves. Only shepherds will. The Maccabees stood up. Today you've got major evangelical, major evangelical leaders misleading the church into the, the, the ways of Satan. You just think of it. You just think of it. People who deny substitutionary atonement, deny propitiation, compromising in same-sex marriage, compromising in homosexuality the way Hillsong is. Hillsong's compromising in homosexuality, one sex scandal after another on top of the financial scandals, but they still singing hill songs, <laughs> paying royalties still. These are hirelings. Jesus comes in the character of the Maccabees. Verse 19 of John 10, there arose a division among the Judeans because of these words. Okay. There was a division. Well, we can go on where he asserts his deity, but let's look at something towards the end of this chapter. This commandment in verse 18, I received from my Father. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. Be careful of those who say the Jews killed Jesus or the Romans killed Jesus. He laid his life down of his own initiative. Nobody could have taken his life from him. Nobody. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts. Chapter 4. Verse 27, Peter says, For truly in this city there were gathered against thy holy servant Jesus. And this draws on the imagery of Psalm 2. They take counsel against the Lord and his anointed, his Messiah. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. God takes the blame. It was not only the Jews, it was the Romans. It was the Gentiles and the Jews were all responsible for his death. But it wouldn't have happened except by the forintention of God. To say nothing of the fact that not all Jews were party to it. The apostles certainly weren't. Now let's look at this further. There are three people blamed for the death of Jesus. Three. Only three. God himself. It was the will of the Lord to smite him. Jesus said, I lay my life down. That's the first. Second, Satan. If they knew God would raise him from the dead, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It was the ultimate gam gambit. Jesus double-crossed Satan with the resurrection. <laughs> okay. Third, Judas Iscariot. Woe to that man by whom he was betrayed. For although it was written, woe would be better if he'd never been born. Remember, Judas is the son of perdition. He's a type of the Antichrist. The picture of the Antichrist. Judas, Satan, and God himself are the three people who have a culpability. A culpability. We have to draw a distinction between culpability and responsibility. The culpability for the death of Jesus is God, Satan, and Judas. Responsibility is all of us. Yeah, it was the Roman government, it was the Jews, it was the Herodians, they all did it. They were all in on it. Well, let's go on looking at this.
Verse 28. In 27, my sheep hear my voice. The Messiah makes the people hear. Let's look at verse 25. I told you, and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name. These bear witness to me. John 5, the works also bear witness. Notice it's never the works themselves, but the works bear witness. The works, the miraculous deeds of Jesus bear witness. But despite the fact that he did these works, people didn't believe, did they? We'll come back to that. Let's continue. My sheep hear my voice, verse 27. I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them. They shall never perish. No one shall snatch them. That word snatch, harpezo, rapture. Same word for rapture. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, he talks about this in certain terms. The sheep, okay, the thief who comes to destroy, and the snatching, probaton, kleptos, thief, harpezo, Forcibly snatch. Grammatically, the action, harpezo, is speaking of the action not of the probaton, but of the kleptos. Not of the probaton, but of the kleptos. The text says the devil cannot make you fall away. The devil cannot steal us from the hand of the Lord. It is speaking of the action of the kleptos, the thief, the enemy, the devil. It is not speaking of the action of the probaton, the sheep. The text is not saying someone cannot backslide cannot wander away, cannot fall away. It is not saying that. It says nothing like that. It's not addressing the action of the sheep, of the probaton. It's addressing only the action of the kleptos, the thief. Let no one tell you that you cannot backslide. Now the good shepherd leaves the 99 for the one. If the sheep wanders away, the Lord will go after him. That's something different. But the idea that somebody cannot fall away from the Lord is ridiculous. That is not what the passage teaches. That is a distortion of certain Calvinists. Let us continue. That the blind would see, and the ones who see become blind. Remember, like the parable of the vineyard in Matthew. Jesus had to explain privately what these parables meant to his disciples. But it says the Pharisees knew he was talking about them. <laughs> they knew. They knew. Let's continue now. Back to John 10, 22. It's Hanukkah. Took place at Jerusalem. Hanukkah was ideally celebrated in Jerusalem then. People who'd celebrated the Feast of Booths, if they could, would just stay over several weeks to Hanukkah rather than walk all the way back to Galilee and then turn around and walk back again. If they were able, they would just stay there. 
It was winter, and he was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. As we will see after the break, what transpired was this. Antiochus set up the image in the temple, a picture of the abomination of desolation, and slaughtered a pig, an unclean animal, on the altar. The stones of the altar were holy, made kudesh, they could not be thrown away, disposed of, but they were ritually defiled. They did not know what to do with the stones. We know from the Mishnah, they stacked the stones up in Solomon's portico. They believed that at Hanukkah, the Messiah would make himself known at Hanukkah. They believed the Messiah would reveal himself to be the Messiah at Hanukkah. And that he, or possibly Elijah, would tell them what to do with the stones at Hanukkah time. <laughs> they couldn't throw them away, they couldn't keep them. Okay. The Judeans, therefore, gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. They believed the Messiah would reveal himself to be the Messiah at Hanukkah. Remember, they wanted somebody to depose the Romans as the Maccabees deposed the Greeks. He said, I told you, and you don't believe. The works I did in my father's name, these bear witness to me. Only the Messiah can make a blind person see. My sheep hear my voice. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, that goes on. Verse 33, the Jews answered, for good work we don't stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself out to be God. Then Morris Cervello's favorite verse, has it not been written in your Torah, I said you are gods, meaning surrogates of God, representatives of gods in the context. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture can't be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Notice they knew the sense of being the Son of God, having one nature, the same as a father and a son. This is the Jehovah's Witnesses' ridiculous argument. You have a father and a son. Uh, the father is greater in position than the son. But in terms of genetic constituency, they're both homo sapiens. They have one nature, don't they? They're both co-equally human. Well, the father is greater than Jesus in position, not in nature. This was not an issue to the Jews of the time. It's only an issue to the Jehovah's Witnesses of our time. <laughs> if I don't do the works of my father, don't believe me. But if I do them, Though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Therefore they were seeking again to seize him, and he eluded their grasp, just as he did in Nazareth. And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing. And he was staying there. Many came to him and were saying, while well, John performed no sign, everything John said about this man was true. Many believed in him there. Understand the lies of the late John Wimber. That man had a lying spirit. He spoke for the devil. It was for good reason. Chuck Smith threw him out of Calvary Chapel. John Wimber had a lying spirit. He spoke for the devil. Propagating this false gospel of power encounters, that the signs and wonders, supernatural demonstrations of power were going to cause people to believe. As we see at Hanukkah, they saw the signs. They saw things only the Messiah could do, and they still did not believe. It is a complete lie. Remember what Jesus warned. A wicked and an gen adulterous generation seeks a sign. Scripturally, it's always these signs follow. Jesus never allowed miracles, signs, wonders, healings to be the focus of his message or his ministry. As we've often said, 
Did Jesus have healings? Yes. Did he have a healing crusade? Never. Did Jesus have miracles? Yes. And his medical miracles could be medically authenticated, not like today, one leg is bigger than the other. <laughs> Pull the other one. The Lord healed me of a bad back. Praise God. Find me somebody over the age of 50 who doesn't have a bad back. <laughs> So this is not to deny the authenticity of, 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 of actual healing, but it, 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 it is a real healing. It can be medically documented. For which one of these signs are you stoning me? But although John the Baptist did no miracle, many believed in him there because everything John said about him was true. Faith cometh by seeing signs and wonders, no. This was the Jewish feast of signs and wonders. It's when Antiochus was deposed. As we'll see in the next session, Antiochus is a major, major picture of the Antichrist. He's one of the three biggest pictures of the Antichrist in Scripture. Was the one, the picture of the Antichrist. Well, how are the Antichrist and false prophets going to deceive people? One of the major ways we're told in Revelation and in the Olivet Discourse, counterfeit signs and wonders. The way Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron. That's how the Antichrist is going to bamboozle people. That's how he's going to bamboozle the apostate church. But although John did no miracle, everything John said about him was true, and many believed in him there. Now remember, as we looked at last Wednesday, John was the son of a high priest. He could have been a member of the Sanhedrin religious establishment, but he went out to the wilderness. All Jerusalem went out to the wilderness to hear John preach, didn't they? Why? because they weren't being taught the truth in Jerusalem in the temple. When Jesus comes back, it'll be the same thing. People will not be taught the truth in the mainstream churches and denominations. They're going to have to go out into the wilderness <laughs> if you want to hear the truth. If you want to know what you need to know to get ready for Jesus to come back, you're not going to find it in a church in, in any denominational sense. So John performed no sign. Everything John said was true. Faith does not come by seeing miracles or seeing healings. These signs follow. They have their place, but they follow. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God. There's this wacko in Denmark goes around filming people that he prays for their healing on the street, and that's how he grows his, his like group, which is like sort of cultic. He's, he's doing the same thing they did here. <laughs> no, no, no. That's not how it works. Faith cometh by seeing nothing. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing the word of God. Then comes the signs and wonders. Then comes the miracles. Neskador Hayapo, a great miracle happened here. That's true. But what is the lamp a picture of? Thy word is the lamp. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are 
expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo. What the scripture actually teaches about the rapture. The snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo. All available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.